Hey, welcome family. Welcome to another Crown Church Bible study. Super excited that you're you're tuning in and you're hearing this broadcast. And what we've been doing, uh, just to get right into it, we've been deep diving into the uh, book of Revelation and the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And today we are going to cover the next church. Super excited about this one as well. All of the churches we've learned from them. And so we want to continue and unpack. We're going to go line by line. We're going to go about line by line and just unpack, see what the spirit is saying. Um, now, the book of Revelation is a deep book, so we're not going to go ocean deep, but we're going to go deep um, to where we can uh, um, uh, pull out application for our lives, see what it is actually saying, what the writer was saying, but then also see what the application is for the hearers of the word. And so uh, my main text that we'll be unpacking is Revelation um, chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. Revelation 3, 7 through 13 is the main text that we will be unpacking um, for today. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13, and it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Verse eight. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So we're here discussing the church in Philadelphia. This is the sixth church, the church in Philadelphia. This is the sixth church in uh, geographically, Philadelphia was located about 28 miles southeast of Sardis. We recently covered Sardis. And the name combines two Greek words. It combines love and it combines brothers. That's where we get the, uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It combines two Greek words, love and brothers, to get Philadelphia. Now, the city was also prone to earthquake. That's going to be important um, at a later time in, in, this, in this Bible study. And the city was known for its numerous vineyards, and it produced uh, an abundant amount of wine, which led citizens to worship Dionysus, right? Dionysius. And that is, for them at that time, the god of wine because of how much wine that it produced. Now, the king of Pergamum, we recently covered this church, the church in Pergamum. The king of Pergamum founded the city in 189 BC and named it Philadelphia because of his brother's loyalty to him. So that was the, 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 the story behind the name Philadelphia. It was named because of his brother's loyalty to him. And his brother was also the king of Lydia, right? And so now in verse seven, it opens up in verse seven in Revelation three, it says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. First and foremost, we see holy and we see true. What he is distinguishing and what he is saying, Jesus is communicating that he is set apart from sinners and that he also is complete, completely sinless. When he's talking about he who is holy, he's set apart from sinners and he's completely sinless without and also without any moral blemish. Perfect in all of his ways. Talking about holy. He's set apart. He's not like us. 
right? Every character, and true, it's talking about every character, quality he possesses is consistently true all the time and in every instant. He is authentic. You know, these times that we live in, it's very difficult to find authenticity. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm, I'm in, in other words, he's saying I'm the real deal. I'm the real deal. He is not a copy. He is not flaky. He is genuine. And so this letter that they're receiving is, hey, you're getting a letter from the one that is sinless, that is set apart from sinners. He is perfect in all of his ways. He is the real deal. He is genuine. That's what that that's what the opening of this letter is communicating. But then he says he who have the key of David that ties back to messianic prophecy. Right? That ties back to messianic prophecy because the key indicates control and authority. Whenever you see keys, it's indicating control, it's indicating authority. Therefore, when he says, I have the key of David, right? He is saying, I have control of David's domain, which is Jerusalem, the city of David and the kingdom of Israel. So the fact that he holds the key shows that he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He is the ruler of the new Jerusalem and the Lord of the kingdom of heaven. This is the greeting that he's giving to the city of Philadelphia. And verse eight says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength. Have kept the, my word and have not denied my name. That's Revelation three verse eight. First thing, I want you to write down a couple of notes for this one. A couple of notes for this one. First thing that we have to understand is that God does not open doors for us to remain idle. God does not open doors for us to remain idle. When God opens a door, it's for a purpose, right? Watch this now. God does not open doors for us to remain idle. The second thing is open doors are there for us to go through them. Listen, if God opens a door, what you doing going through a window? Open doors are meant for us to go through them and see what we do for God, right? With the little that we have left, because it says you have a little that I set before you an open door and you have a little left, but you've kept my word. And so, and so we're, we're, we're going to get back to the open door in a second, but what we do for God with the little that we have left will always have a greater impact than what we did past tense for the enemy with all of our strength. So he's, he's commending them that you have a little bit, you have a little strength, but you've kept my word. You have not denied my name. Listen, a lot of times we're waiting to be in full capacity in our emotions. We're waiting to be in full capacity in our feelings in full capacity in our faith to feel like we have to do anything for God. And this church here is showing us that you don't have to be in full strength to do the work of God. Oh, Come on. I know that resonated with somebody. You don't have to be in full strength to do God's work. You don't have to be in full faith to do God's work. All you have to do is keep the faith. All you have to do is keep the strength that you have remaining. Somebody type in the chat. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Right. Listen, I'll say it again. What we do for God with the little that we have left will always have a greater impact than what we did for the enemy with all of our strength. And then he, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to, to this, this, this statement here of open door, open door. Contrary to what you and I may have heard and have been exposed to in Christendom, in church, contrary to what we may believe, what we have to understand is that open door, I'm going to, I'm going to debunk some things real quick. I'm going to debunk some things real quick. Open door does not mean dollars. I see an open door. Open door does not mean cars. Open doors does not mean houses. Open door does not mean luxury. 
open door does not mean prosperity. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. I'm going to just pause for dramatic effect. Open door does not mean those things. It's not referencing possessions. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 through 9. We're going to read a series of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Then we're going to go to Colossians chapter 4. Then we're going to go to Acts chapter 14. And the reason for it is I want to show you from the word of God that open doors does not mean dollars, cars, houses, prosperity, luxury. That's not what open doors mean. Have it been used metaphorically? Absolutely. Has it been used for as a figure of speech? Absolutely. But theologically, as we exegese the text, that's not what it's referencing. When we see open door, when the when 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 it's I have put I have set before you an open door, it's it there there's it it means something. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8 through 9, it's saying, in 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 the meantime, verse 8. I, Paul, will be staying here at Ephesus until the festival of the of Pentecost. Verse nine is why I'm here. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. Somebody in the chat real quick, right in the chat. Open doors are for work. Open doors are for work. There is an open door for a great work. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 12, it says, Paul, again, when I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me, for me to do what? Preach the good news of Christ. It's Colossians chapter four, verse three. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us. Watch this now. Colossians chapter four, verse three, that God would open to us a door for what purpose? For the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chain one in chains. One more Acts chapter 14, verse 27. It says now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. You guys see that? So open door means openness of regions, openness of groups of people, openness of specific individuals to hearing the gospel and trusting in Jesus Christ. That's what open doors are. So whenever you have an open door, watch this. Now I want you to write this down. I want you to write this down. I want you to write this down. As a matter of fact, first I want you to write it down. And then when it hits your spirit, I want you to write it in the chat. When it hits your spirit, I want you to write it down. So write it down first. And then when it hits your spirit, I want you to drop it in the chat. Open doors. I want you to write this down. Open doors. God opens doors for his glory. Not for our gratification. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Write it down. When it hits your spirit, write it in the chat. God opens doors for his glory. Not for our gratification. Yeah, yeah. So that's extremely important. So whatever door that you find yourself walking through, it's not for your gratification. It's not for you to go in there. It's not for you to gloat. It's not for you to, to feel like you've arrived. It is for his glory. God opens doors for his glory, not for our gratification. So he opens a door for you to do more business. That's for his glory. He opens more door. He opens a door for you to, for you to, um, um, reach a person, uh, 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 whether it be a, a organization, a network of people, uh, different type of people. That's for his glory. It's not for you to go in there and play selfish. It's not for you to go in there and keep it for yourself. It's not for your gratification. There is a purpose for why that door has opened. I'm going to say it one more time. God opens doors. 
It's important to understand that it is God who opens doors. It is God who closed doors. God opens doors. God's clo God closes doors. It is not for us. And the thing that we need to understand that's extremely important is when it comes to these doors, there, when it comes to these doors, watch this now. He is saying that he is the source. I'm going to give you, let me, let me, let me add, let's build on this. Let's build on this. I want you to write this down. God is the source of every opportunity, which means when he opens door. So opportunity means a open door. When a door is open, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity and that opportunity requires you to engage it. It requires you to walk through it. It requires you to get to work. It requires you to get to work, walk through the door and get to work. God is the source of every door. So he can, he, he'll open doors. Hallelujah. He'll open doors that no one can shut. God is the ultimate gatekeeper. Listen, I know people try to stand in your way. Listen, when God decides to open a door of opportunity for you, no one can shut it. But you got to walk through it. And you have to understand that the purpose for the door is to get to work for his glory. So God is the one. He is the source of every opportunity, which means when you write opportunity, I want you in parentheses to, in parentheses to put open doors. God is the source of every opportunity open door, every opportunity. But at the same time, God is the source of every, every season of peace and protection. Closed doors. Which means there are doors that God is closing and that is for our peace. That is for our protection. That's probably because it's time for you to move on. That's probably because it's time for you to rest for a season. It's not time. So if God closes a door, it doesn't matter who you call. It doesn't matter what you do. It will not open. When God closes a door, just, just, just stay in the hallway. Just, just stay in the hallway. Somebody type in the chat, stay in the hallway. Just, just stay in the hallway. It's not opening. It don't matter what you do. You can kick, scream, claw at it. It's not going to open. Just stay in the hallway, right? God opens the door. That's opportunity. But then when he closes a door, it also means that it may be a season of peace and protection. Now, verse nine says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. This reference here, there was a group in those days called the Judaizers, right? There was a group called the Judaizers. And Jesus is indicating a specific group in a specific area called the Judaizers. And, the, and, and Jesus said these offenders were Jews in name only. What he says, in, as we go further, he says they belong to Satan and serve him. So what they were doing was they was trying to pull people out of grace into works. Right. I want you to show I'm going to show you something. And then Paul checks the church because these people were coming in and they were trying to shift the people of God moving from grace to works. And we got to be careful in the days that we live in that people don't come in and try to put yokes and burdens on us and go, no, you got to do this to get this way. You got to this and this verse and, and try to put traditions and pull us out of grace into self effort, into works in Galatians chapter one. Verse six through nine, turn there. Galatians chapter one, verse six through nine. Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into in or in the grace of Christ. He called us in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. I'm, I'm shocked that you turn into a different gospel, which is not another. Just in case, just so you know, there's not another gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. How do they do that? But even if we, Paul is speaking now, even if we or an angel from heaven, watch this now. There's so much in there. Listen, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. 
as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you other than what we receive, let him be a curse. See, see, see a lot of, there's a lot of people that I'm hearing now talk about how an angel, an angel, an angel said this, an angel said that. Listen, any angel that says anything that's different than the gospel that we have been left, you are not. It says, let him be a curse. It just think Paul said, just in case it really did come from heaven. If it is not consistent with this word, Paul even said, if I start preaching something different, let him be a curse. And we got to be careful because we are quick to follow any new thing, any new thing. But is it consistent with the gospel that we have been left? And then he continues in chapter three, verse one through three. He says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Verse two, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Holy Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human efforts? So that's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They were twisting God's word to try to put burdens on them. And here's what Jesus has said. They will bow at your feet. See, all who are trying to hurt you and I with the twisting of God's word will be humbled before you. See, the reason they're going to be humbled is they're going to serve as evidence that God is pleased with your faithfulness before him. I'm going to say it this way. God's endorsement of you often sh often shows through the humiliation of your adversaries before you. Now, hear me. Your church brother and sister is not your adversary. OK, you may not like you may not like their personality. You may disagree with something. Listen, your brother and sister in the faith is not your adversary. I'm talking about those who are contrary to the faith that we hold so dear. Stop fighting them. Instead, stay faithful to God and he will humble them in time. Verse 10, because you have kept my word and my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Jesus is saying here, Jesus said the hour of trial is coming. Notice what he says. He says the hour of trial, verse 10, is coming on the world. He doesn't say the church. It's coming on the world, not the church. So the judgment unleashed in the tribulation will fall on those who dwell on the earth. Now, uh, scholars debate this. Um, they debate that Jesus will take Christians out of the world before this tribulation period begins in an event that we know and that have been that have been labeled as the rapture. And the reason that a lot of people comes to this conclusion of the rapture is because the Greek word translated from, he says in verse 10, he says, I, uh, I also will keep you from from the hour of trial, verse 10, from the hour of trial. The word from is translated from the Greek word ek, ek, meaning out of. I will keep you out of the hour, the hour of trial, right? So unlike other forms of hardship, right? There's other forms of hardship when God promises to be with us and to keep us as we go through, as we are in those difficulties, the church will be kept out of the tribulation. That's where scholars would debate that and come to that conclusion. Now, some people will argue the position and say, no, there's mid, 
mid-tribulation or pre-tribulation that we the church won't experience any of it. Then there's some that are mid-tribulation uh, where they feel like midway in the tribulation after the, after the three and a half years of peace that the church will be raptured out. And then there's some that believe post-tribulation. So mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib. If you ever heard that word, that's the context it's talking about. So in, in if the church were destined to be kept through the tribulation, the Greek word dia, dia, or dia, meaning through, could be used. And so instead of saying, uh, I will keep you through the hour of trial, instead it's, I will keep you out of the hour of trial, right? And notice one of the things that happens is Jesus does not bring any accusations against the church of Philadelphia like some of the other churches. As a matter of fact, only Philadelphia and Smyrna have this distinction where no accusations were brought to them. He asked, as a matter of fact, he commends them for their patience and he commends them for their endurance. They did not give in. They did not give up. They did not give in to the external pressures or false doctrines from the culture. So because this church showed patience, Jesus promised that he would keep them from the hour of trial. Verse 11, verse 11, verse 11 and 12 closes like this. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. So what he's doing is he's urging the believers in Philadelphia to hold fast, to keep a firm grip on the truth and their loyalty to him. And so by doing this, they would prohibit the enemy from grabbing their crown. The Bible oftentimes refers to crown as rewards. There's different rewards in, in the form of crown and crown is a form of authority, delegated authority, right? So the Philadelphians believe they, 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 the believers believe the believers would have been familiar with marathon races. When he's talking about hold fast, he's talking about, I'll give him a crown. They would have been because of, of the games that are held in the region, in the city, they are familiar with marathon races races and to complete a marathon successfully a runner had to adhere to strict disciplines in their physical body in their training and they had to abide by the rules governing the race so to 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 win you you had to make sure that you were properly disciplined in your in your nutrition properly disciplined in your exercise and also disciplined to adhere to the rules of the games that's what they had to do and so if they won the race, they would receive a crown as the reward. In the same way, we too, we are running a marathon that requires a couple of things. It requires discipline. It requires patience. It requires endurance. It requires that. And then Jesus says, he says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. The ancient city of Philadelphia was vulnerable. It, it's the city actually sat on fault line on a fault line. So it was vulnerable to earthquakes that collapsed the buildings. And so by contrast, when he was saying, I will make them a pillar in a city that was unstable from earthquakes, they could understand the importance and the significance of that statement. By contrast, God is suggesting that nothing can cause the conquering believer to tremble and fall. That's what he was saying to them in Philadelphia. So in essence, in essence, he was saying, I will stabilize you. I will establish you. Even though everything may be shaken around, everything may be falling around, everyone may be collapsing around, everyone is going down. I will establish you. I will fortify you. I will stabilize you. I will establish you and that you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to, I will establish you. I will make him a pillar 
and, 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 and you have to get the picture of the architecture of these temples. They were splendid, right? The, the ruins that we have remaining doesn't do justice to how awesome and magnificent these temples that they built back then were. These pillars, these columns were huge. And in the midst of an earthquake, it collapsed. And God is saying, these pillars collapsed, right? But I will establish him. I'm reminded of the one who hears the word and does the word. He shall be like the one that built his house on a rock. And when the rain came, when, when the winds blew, his house was founded on the rock. It beat against the house, but it, was, it stood. But the one that does it is like the one that built on sand. When the rain came, the, 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 the state of that house, the fall of the house was great. And so then he also says, he talks about his name and see what we have to understand is that possessing the name of our heavenly father, the name of the new Jerusalem and the name, the new name of Jesus suggests that believers will receive honors that will abide eternally. Essentially what they're communicating here is this entire world is temporary. This entire world is collapsing, but if you will endure if you will stand firm, if you will stand fast in the Lord, you will be established for all eternity. Hallelujah. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you are saying through your word. Through the letter to the church in Philadelphia. May we also have an ear to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches so that we may be edified so that we may be transformed, so that we may be equipped to go through every open door to do your work for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.